I mean, the last files, monk that stuff, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I listened to it and I, I love how you start the record. Well, well, you needn't such a cool version. You just like, wow, jump into the water and go there. And I wanted to ask you how important was like, you know, everyone talks about monk, but uh, of course he was a genius, but how important was Frankie Dunlop for you? Because I think he's one of the most underrated drummers probably ever, like, do you see an influence of his playing on you, or like, did you ever think about that? For me, he was a huge influence. Um, and I think you are correct in that he is truly underrated. Um, Frankie, for me, and for Monk, I'm quite sure, embodied the space, the openness, and the, the, the linear aspect or the, the, the quirkiness of his Monk's writing. Frankie made room for that. It wasn't like mm -hmm. Frankie was trying to come and force his bebop vocabulary or his way of, of playing on top of Monk's music. It seemed like he, you know, it was just a, a match made in heaven. He really, yeah. I think he was really concerned with just fitting in and doing, serving the music. And that's how I've been in uh, my career. I, I've been always yeah. about serving the music, not necessarily, you know, sometimes I, I listen to cats and I'm like, man, I wish I had as many chops as this guy and I could play really fast. But then when it really comes down to music, I mean, if it doesn't need it, then why put it there? And, you know, mm -hmm. some people say, well, if you don't got it, then you can't, you know, you don't know if it needs it, you know? And, and, I, and, I, and I, my answer to that is I listen, there are a lot of talented people out there, but sometimes I hear records and I'm, I am, um, distracted by the amount of talent or, or technique that's yeah, happening that that's mm -hmm. actually you know <laughs> in, impeding on, on on the soloist or or this beautiful melody or something like that i understand that you know um technique is is youthful energy sometimes you know but i've always prided myself on trying to be a more mature player i've learned that um working with ellis and, you know, he was a big uh, proponent on just serving the music, not necessarily serving yourself with the technique. So yeah. Frankie, yeah, Frankie's, uh, his vibe, his way of playing is a huge influence on me. Mm -hmm. And it was super important to, you know, to, to keep that at the forefront as I did this Monk record. Yeah. Um, how did you, why did you decide to do that record, by the way? I mean, what was the story um, behind it? It's... It's kind of funny. The, 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 the real story behind it is um, I have a 14, well, she's 14 and, and my son is 11. But at that time, they were, so the month record was in 2014, I think. 14, so yeah. they're quite younger, right? So um, my daughter's school asked me to, you know, do a, a little concert for the kids. Oh, and... Wow. Um, so I hired, you know, Mike Rodriguez, uh, Yasushi Nakamura, Donald Vega. And, oh, okay. And, you know, and, and we just went in and, you know, it was just for kids. So you, you kept it short. We played like three or four songs. And um, I thought Muck was quirky enough that the kids could get him. You know, there, there's so much space and so much personality in his music. Um, yeah. So I said, well, well let's just do Monk. And we did the we did the show. The kids loved it. They were jumping around and like. And I was like, and I talked to Mike and Yusushi afterwards. I said, man, we should probably try to record this thing. Uh, Chad was on it also. I said, well, we should try to record this. And Yusushi he was like, yeah, man, we should do it. Let's let's do it. And so I started thinking. I was like, okay, let me. Um, I hadn't really at this point. I hadn't really flushed out any like arrangements. I just you know maybe a couple 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 things we changed up. But at that point, I said, well, I sit down at the piano and it really kind of seemed to unfold right in front of me at the piano. Like, it was just like, my main objective was I wanted to keep the melody 
and in the integrity of Monk's music. You know how like sometimes you can rearrange tunes, which and they're nice, but like you can rearrange it so much that the tune is not recognizable. Yeah, it doesn't make so, sense anymore. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and yeah, and, you know, and and the people that that have done that, you know, I'm not bashing them at all. But for me, it was super important that I wanted it to be recognizable, and I wanted all the solos. And I and I I told the guys this um, because I all of them didn't have that approach when we were in the studio. I said, well, when you listen to Monk play, you can put the needle down or we're talking about needle you can put yeah. the cd yeah, yeah, sure. it, at any point any point of his solo and you know what song that he's playing yeah you know there's so it's many thematic development so many yeah. right you yeah. know you it sounds like oh he's playing well you need oh it sounds like he's playing you know Roman, whatever it is and so it was super important for me that even though like i've changed the rhythm aspect of, of monk, what was happening on these monks tunes, monk tunes. Um, I wanted the guys to pay homage to the, the melody in Character. their solos. Yeah. It, it wasn't just like, yeah, it wasn't like a, just a free for all. Let's play the head and then like, whatever you want to play. You, it's whatever you want to play, but you have to respect that melody that's happening. Within. It has to be a yeah. full, like, yeah, it has to be, yeah, a full circle. And I think that this is the thing that ties it in together. So, you know, um, I have, you know, my kids are young. They're not jazz kids, but they listen to the record and they can, they can connect the dots. They're like, oh yeah, dad, I see that. And I can see this and, you know, and that makes me yeah. feel good. That makes me feel like I've actually succeeded in what I, what I, you know, started yeah. out to do. So um, makes sense. Yeah. I guess that was a long winded answer, but. Uh, <laughs> no, no, beautiful. <laughs> no, no, yeah, sure. You know, yeah. <laughs> but you, you you usually do like I mean I wanted to ask you later this but I'll ju jump in now like uh, you mentioned piano right and rearranging monk mm -hmm. is that's where you usually write your songs your compositions also on, on piano or what's your approach there I mean and I also second sub question like how how important is melody in your tunes as well you know you, you wrote some beautiful melodies like Dali you know that beautiful mm -hmm. uh, on thank you on Dali in Cobble yeah, Hill. Yeah, on, on Dali in Cobble Hill, yeah. Yeah, I, I love that one. It's such a beautiful beautiful song, and that walk on the BHB, the 9-4 groove. And... Yeah, yeah, Brooklyn, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I appreciate it. How is your approach when composing? How do you start usually, and what's your progress well, there? you know, um, I, years ago, I had a guitar and I would take it. Oh, really? Oh, wow. And, and, and just acoustic guitar, you know, I was just, I, I wasn't, you know, I was just into it because I've always been into pop music and rock and like just writing songs. So when I play guitar, it, it just puts me like, like you can play guitar and play a chord and almost like sing a note that goes yeah. with that. And you sound like you're like a folk singer. It's like, oh, yeah. it's great. So, you know, I was doing that for a while. And to, uh, to be honest, like I was in Japan one time and I was, you know, jet lagged and I'm up like three o'clock or two o'clock in the morning playing, I'm playing light. And somebody's like, boom, boom, boom. You know, I was just like, well, you know, I couldn't. And so I was like, okay, let me just kind of let this go. And, um, but piano was always, you know, I wasn't, a, I'm not a pianist, but like, like I said with Ellis, Ellis made me have a relationship with the piano. He was just like, if you were gonna play in, or if you're gonna be in this music, in this, this, uh, in mm -hmm. jazz, you either got to play vibes or you got to play piano. You have to play some kind of, you know, melodic instrument. Yeah. And, and, you know, at the time, I wasn't necessarily happy that he said that because I was just like, I just wanted to play drums. But, you know, hindsight, of course, having him having me shared on piano is everything is there, you know, um, the melody, harmony, bass. Yeah. And, and it, it really comes um, in handy with all the production that I do. So every tune, I, I'd say 90%, 85% to 90% of the tunes that I write and arrange start at piano, you know? Uh -huh. um, and the other 15% comes with a rhythmic idea that I may hear in my head before going to the piano. Yeah. So I, I've never... I've never written a song at the drums. I, I know some guys, you know, some great drummers, you know, they, they write at the drums, they sit at the drums and they sing or they come up with a part. Yeah. And sometimes you can, you know, that's great, but sometimes you can tell like the drum part is, is like so, so 
important or so strong so identifiable it's like you can tell that this at least i can i can tell that the song was crafted yeah. around the drum part <laughs> you know um there's only a few cases where that wasn't necessarily the case whereas you like you think of steve gatt when he did 50 ways to leave your level with paul oh, yeah. Simon. for instance yeah. you yeah. know that now that's a song that paul wrote but they crafted it together in the studio and yeah. steve was you know he's steve gatt so um I think everyone in the world knows that's a great song, but the drum part is right up there with everything else. And, you know, maybe he should have been credited with part of, you know, the writing process yeah. also, you know, because Absolutely. it's so identifiable. So, um, yeah, but I never, I never sit out and write tunes from the drums. I think with that fear of it sounding like a drum tune, you mm, know, okay. um, you know, and at the end of the day, some sometimes that stuff is it's it's fun. Like you write something in thirteen. You know, if you're gonna write something like it's, you know, I think it has to come from the drums. It's hard to, you know, to yeah. like, let me think of a thirteen beat melody or something. Yeah, you know, whatever it is, you know. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, do, do do you write for the players? Yeah. Usually, let, let, let's say the the Lee project, right? Uh, did you when you wrote those tunes? Did you know that you're play, writing for Chris and Adam and those guys, or like did I you did, do yeah. just, Ah, you did. Oh, okay. For 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 like, if I'm doing it, actually, let me think about it. Um, most of my tunes are written for a specific project. Oh, I guess that kind of keeps me keeps me on. Uh, I, I guess it gives me a, a little little push and it keeps my focus on on um, on what I'm doing and and it's nice because you can hear that person's yeah sound exactly. in in your head um, you know so yeah with Adam and Chris Potter and Ben Street like anything you write is gonna sound pretty good yeah, with those sure. guys you know <laughs> um, you know but it was it, that session that session we did. We, you know, it was for a crisscross, so we had yeah. to do in like one day. And I had, uh, it was a couple of those things that were kind of tricky. And and Chris said that, he was like, man, this is kind of tricky. I'm like, Chris, what are you talking about, man? The way you write? And then Chris yeah. said, no, actually, if you listen to my tunes, they're not tricky. They're, you know, like I'll write on a certain, you know, thematic material, whatever. Yeah. But like, when you when you listen to Chris Potter's music, it's it's really open and it's it's not like super like intricate like you know like somebody like ben windows music you yeah, know for instance it's yeah. not it's not yeah for instance um so when he said that i was like yeah i guess you're right but then i looked at adam i'm like adam your tunes <laughs> you know exactly. adam and I, we're like brothers you know I'm like adam your tunes aren't easy like that and he's like well you know that's me um but uh yeah usually i hear hear the the people that i'm, I'm writing for um, I did a record for Verve years ago that Makoto Ozone was on. Actually, it was a bunch of people. That, I don't think you you heard that because it was only out in in Asia. Mm. Um, Luciana was on there. Uh, Claudia Cunha is oh, on wow. there. James Jean is. Um, who else did I have on there? Uh, what, what's Wilson the name of the record? On there. Saumaye. S A O M A. Oh, so why e yeah it's um and that was like a it was like a kind of a you know dabble into world my like a world music approach yeah. you know um you know i love luciana i love claudia yeah. so you know it's got that element it's got some african element so but i knew that i was gonna have those people on the record so i wrote for those people you know um yeah. so yeah to answer your question yeah i usually know who i'm gonna write for um there's one instance where I didn't, I just, I don't know if you know, I just finished my master's in May. I, so I went back to school. So it oh. happened to work oh. out that it, you know, I went back Congrats. during COVID. Bro. So, <laughs> so the, you know, I didn't, I think one of the big fears when I went back to get my degree was um, missing gigs or having to, you know, miss school because school, you know, it could be a little, Yep. weird about that they don't you know if you're in school you're in school if you're not so um you know i figured i, I crossed that bridge when i get to it and COVID happened and so i went to school in person nine months and then the rest the the rest oh, wow. two a year and a half i was home so 
but case in point, you know, I had a uh, advanced arranging, so I had to do some big band writing um, for that. And it was supposed to be played for the big band, but COVID happened. So I, I wrote a lot of material last oh, year super. that with, with not, without anyone necessarily in mind, but because they were more um, assignments from, yeah, from, the yeah, teachers, yeah. from the teachers. Yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah. It was fun though. Yeah, no, it's so important what, what you said, you know, writing for people. It's like this Ellingtonian approach kind of, you know, it's because it, it makes sense, you know, if, if you're going to have Adam Rogers or Bill Frizzell, you know, you write completely exactly. different because it's like, exactly, you know, they're both amazing, yeah. but completely different personalities, of course. So. No, I, I think it's super, you know, I I think it's, it's respectful also. Yeah, exactly. When, you know, some people hire an all-star band and then they and they and they like i don't want to say they force their compositions but they bring in compositions without regard of that person's career or the, that person's style where they played yeah. and then they're in the studio and they're like let's do this and then maybe maybe the, that person is into it you know like trying it but it's out of their wheelhouse and yeah. if it's you know slowing up the session or whatever then how effective are you being? You know, exactly. Yeah. Do you want? I think. I think a lot of times you hire somebody um, to play on your record because you want that sound, that approach. So exactly. why take them out of that? You know, if you're gonna hire an iconic person, you know. Yeah, I agree. You hire Bill Frizzell, and you're like, Bill, man, you, you, can you play? Like, can you do like, that Van Halen thing? Yeah, exactly, or something. <laughs> like, no, no, no. But you know, no. Bill, and, and and Bill, you know, bless his heart, he's Bill would be like. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, you would no, no, no. You know? no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Greetings to Bill. So. <laughs> no, that's no. my man, man. I oh, love, I love Bill. Me too. I play with him every single day. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a master. But uh, I, I, you, you know, you mentioned Adam, and you know, I did this talk with Adam, and I'm such a huge fan. Oh Adam. yeah, Adam. Yeah, and you know, I have all those records you guys did, like Art of the Invisible, Allegory, Apparitions, and you know, I transcribed like I think. 15 solos of those records by Adam. So I kind of oh. tr tried to figure out the structures and everything. And, um, you know, like the Invisible, the 7-4. And the, when I listen to you play there, it sounds so effortless talking about heavy compositions. And I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, you, those were done also for Criss Cross. So it's, again, like... They were. Really they were done sessions. in a day. Yeah. So, uh, like, how is your approach when... I mean, I, I guess you guys, of course, rehearsed, like, Absalom and Elf and all those songs... But uh, how is your approach when playing like someone's, like let's say Adam's compositions, which is quite intricate and complicated, although it makes sense still, but you make it sound like, okay, you know, Clarence floating water over, like kind of. Well, I mean, I think Adam, you know, he's, you know, short of a genius and, and, you know, his composition is playing. He's definitely one of my favorite players. Yeah. Um, but the tunes are intricate. They're they're difficult, and I felt like, and I do feel like my job in general is to to connect that mm. that music to the listener in 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 the best way that I can. And so, my approach is always to how can I make this, you know, for lack of a better word, sound. Uh, what's um, I don't want to say be more musical, but like cohesive or glue I, cohesive like, exactly yeah. right because you don't you know like certain drummers could play adam's music and it sounds like it, it could sound like math music it could sound like yeah, very yeah. No. You know, very you know and and you know my my approach was to put it yeah i want to i always want to put a sheen on over the music and then when you go inside you say oh shit really that's what they're doing that's what you know it's like yeah well that doesn't sound like seven or that didn't sound like a bar the two you know like exactly. adam has these weird phrases odd phrases and things like that and i don't want the music to sound that way you know so i feel like my when you hire me my job is to 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 be that glue you know you can yeah. you can go back to you know you know what a compressor does over a mix some people say oh no i don't want, yeah. i don't yeah. want a compressor no a compressor really smushes everything in nice little little ball and you know it's not overly but it, it that's what it yeah. does and that's the same approach for me with when i when i got the gig with maria schneider that was my approach oh, yeah. like 
you know, the, uh, Tim, who's an amazing drummer, played in her band forever. And I heard him play, but that wasn't my approach to how I heard her music. And, you know, I guess you could say I was stupid enough or I was something enough to like, when they called me to sub, I played my approach. Oh, I wasn't important. trying to fit in to what the drummer did previously. I was, I was like, this is how I hear the music. This is how I'm going to shape it. And, and, you know, either, you know, she's going to like it and not call me, you know, like it and call me again or not like it and never call me, you know, yeah. but I was, I was, I was strong enough and, and, and believed in myself enough that, that my approach and how I heard her music was going to work. You know, I heard all these beautiful melodies, you know, I guess it, part of it comes from me being classically trained when I was in high school, I only wanted to play classical percussion. That oh, drum really? set didn't oh, wow. really come to me. Oh, wow. Yeah, it didn't come until first year of college that, you know, that I really started considering, oh, maybe I could be a drummer and, and a percussionist, you know, oh, was wow. just that, that, yeah. Um, so when, when I heard Maria's music, you know, these, what was happening in the flutes or what's happening mm -hmm. in, in the, it, the, the baritone sax, what's happening in the second tenor, as opposed to the first tenor, what's happening, you know, those little lines that, that sometimes get overlooked. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I latch on to. And when you play that way, it sounds like you've internalized the music. That's when you you really, and then you can take the music and you can mold it in any, any kind of way. If you're playing only off of the main trump, the sure. first yeah, yeah. trumpet, yeah. Yeah. right, it's, it's, it's one dimensional, right? If I'm playing only off the lead trumpet or off the uh, first tenor, the music doesn't have much dimension. But if I can go inside and see like what this guy is playing, because Maria writes lines against other lines and like yeah, it's so, so beautiful, it's writing. so yeah. intricate and beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And man, why if I can bring attention to those parts that the average listener is not listen, uh, listening for, then it makes the music in, from in my opinion, it makes the music more special. Definitely. And it makes it like wow, what, I didn't hear that. Where is that coming from? And it makes people listen to it, uh, approach listening differently. So, Definitely. Um, yeah, I felt like my my job in general is to, you know, try to um, smooth over these, the, 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 for lack of a better word, the rough lines or the the, the, the jagged yeah. lines. When, when the, because everyone knows when you write and mix meter, you know, the lines could be jagged unless you really spend uh -huh. time. It's an art to being able to write in seven, nine. Make it sound natural. Five, yeah. 11. And make it sound natural, right? Yeah. Without, the, without the audience saying like, what are they doing? What, what, what? you know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah, I you, completely you, agree, yeah. I mean, going back to that, um, the, the, the Monk record, you know, it was so many people that came to me that said, Whoa, I didn't know it was that difficult, man. I tried to transcribe it and it was just like, man, what, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but when you listen to it, it's, you're not saying, yeah. oh my God, exactly. this is so hard. What is that? You know? So. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, Stink, you know? Like Stink or Peter Gabriel, Salisbury Hill. It's like in seven. And you, you listen to exactly. it. Exactly. Like, I, I, for a long time, I, you know, I just listened to that song. You didn't know it. Dude, dude, I didn't know it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But that's, to well, me, that's, that's man, that's the, this is being you right now. So yeah, this is just my opinion. But to me, that's the beauty. Yeah. When you can, when you have these songs, when you listen to, or when you go to Bulgaria yeah. and you go to Balkans, you go to these places in the wedding and they're playing in 17 or 13 exactly you're not saying oh, that, 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 that. it's all one right it was that and you know brecker and i talk is talked um is extensively before he passed about that because you you knew he was going to do a, a balkan record right no seriously yeah man, he was. seriously and I, I, yeah he was definitely he was checking it out um oh man you know we we're checking out Evo Pop, uh, what's his name? Evo Pop Papasso. Papasso. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I love him. Yeah. Man, Brecker was going to do a record like that. So, you know, he was totally, you know, into doing something like that. But when you listen wow. to that, you know, those lines aren't jagged. Those uh -huh. kids dancing in 13 and 17 and 11 or whatever, they're not jag dancing in jagged little circles. Exactly. It's yeah. all one. And so I think 
it is an, it's a talent to be able to write across meters and have it sound you know uh, uh round natural. or yeah. organic or natural you know i mean at the same time i guess some people who they want to write that type of music yeah, yeah. and, and it, there's a specific purpose and that works too you know yeah yeah no you you, you mentioned michael so uh, you know it's this is like almost like this legendary video now already on youtube you guys that life in mexico you know, nah. you know that one? <laughs> all right and, i think uh, i do yeah adam and uh was it yeah. ming doki who's playing bass ming doki yeah yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's yeah it's just like it's it's killing like your solo on that renaissance man i don't know if you remember if I don't it's, remember. <laughs> it's, it's just like you leave so much space also in that solo, yet you burn it. You know, like, and you you see the guys and the band and Mike, they're just like, <laughs> it's so cool. But I wanted to ask you, like, how, how was your experience? How did you get that gig with Mike? And what did you learn the most from Mike? I mean, he's he was he is he was one of my favorite tenor players Me of all too. time, of course. And yeah. But how, how was that experience for you like and when did it begin? That was the well it began right around 2000. Hmm. Um and for the record it's probably the best gig that I I ever had. Yeah, I can imagine. Because he was such a he was a great person more and like, incredible to play with funny to be around sincere like soft spoken and just burning on every yeah. Yeah. every every time he put the sacks in his mouth um i remember him we were talking after a concert and 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 uh he said that some like he he was bothered that like the writers or the 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 writers come to or the the critics come mm -hmm. to the concerts and they still only focus on his technique you know and they were just like and he was just like man you know i'm playing music i'm you know every night i'm doing my this is you know i'm i'm giving it to the gods i'm trying this is what we're doing and you know so some people didn't see that 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 because they were just you know he did have a lot of facility sure. but um man he was a sweet guy he you know uh, made such a uh, impact on my life um i got the gig in 2000 and um how did i get the gig so we knew you know i we had knew we've known each other uh we had known each other let me say i moved in 91 i think we met when my then roommate james genus played in the return of the Be Brecker brothers oh yeah so you remember that in in yeah, the late yeah. 90s yeah yeah sure uh yeah late 90s right mid 90s with dennis chambers and yeah. you know um so since james and i were roommates and dennis chambers was on drums i was at like every concert i could be at you know um sure. so i i think james may have introduced us um at that point um and we just we stayed friends and so around 2000 idris was playing they had just did time of the essence is that oh, right yeah yeah, yeah exactly. it was that record yeah, yeah it was yeah. the idris larry adam and uh yeah i got the call from mike and he was just like you know i got some gigs wanted to know if you'd be interested in you know <laughs> playing or whatever and of course, I'm like, yeah, I called him back as soon as I got the, the message on my answer machine. I'm just like, of course, man, I'm down. But, you know, when and yeah. where I'll come now, you know, um, our first gig was in, uh, I think, Minnesota. Oh, and uh, we didn't even rehearse. It was like he sent me the music. But, you know, I guess I had a reputation of if people send me music that that I'm going to know the music you know, by the time we get to the gig, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not one. I, I've always kind of prided myself on doing the homework. You know, so um, yeah. there are a lot of incredible guys out there that get the music and they'll open it, <laughs> open it up at the rehearsal. You know, just I, like I, I, you I, know, I saw okay. that, I saw that, <laughs> right? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so we got to the gig in Minnesota and played, and like from note one, 
like the the amount of energy that was coming from that horn in Adam and Larry, like I just I just I felt like I was just in the middle of like a a, a cloud, and and yeah. I could just. I could just play. He Brecker wanted me to play. He was just like, "Let's do this. We're going." And um, and from the first gig, he turned around. He was just like, "Man, this is what I was hearing, man." And oh, I was like, oh, "That's beautiful. This is what I'm hearing." You know, <laughs> um, I, I I did ask him. Um, I'm divulging a lot of information on this thing, um, but I asked Brecker one day. I was like, "Man, why, why?" You know, why did you call me, you know, because mm-hmm. you, you got Tane, you got Ralph Peterson, you got Pete, yeah, you got like all of these amazing drummers that you play with. And don't get me wrong, Mike, you know, I love playing with you, but like, you know, sometimes I'm like pinching myself, like how? <laughs> yeah, and sure. he's And Brecker, Brecker said, um, I hired you because I wanted to hear that sound. I wanted you to oh, be wow. you and, 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 and play. And that gave me a, it gave me a, a, a serious boost in confidence. Um, yep. You know, like I could be me, I could play. You know, and and he was totally into that. Um, one huge lesson that I learned, not necessarily from him verbally, but like I learned how to pace myself. You know, because when I first got his gig, mm. I was super excited, and you know, with the excitement, and you're young. You, you know, you can blow yourself out. You don't, you know, you're just like, ah, you're going for it. And you're like, and you, you either, you, 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 sh- you know, you show, you show your hand, meaning that you play everything that you have in your, your arsenal. Yeah. And you still songs, got six yeah. songs yeah, to go. Exactly. <laughs> six, exactly. You know, um, you know, you still got a, a level of trading. You got a soul open solo. You got all of this stuff. So with Brecker, I really learned, learn pacing because Brecker taught me that a lot of times he'd only be at like six gears, gear six, as opposed to gear 10, mm-hmm. or let's break it down. Let's break it down to, uh, let's say four, five gears, you know, sure. Brecker would be in two and a half, three in the audience would think that is so much energy coming off of that horn. And that when, where we are, that they think we're at, we're at the, like, uh, yeah, exactly. we're not there. We still have headroom. And he really taught me how to how to pace myself. Even on ballots, it felt like Brecker was trying to burn out. Like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the 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 intention that he had with even playing a ballot, like the energy that he wanted to conjure up in the band yeah. playing a ballot. You know, I learned that. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like a lot of times like people think. Uh, at least drummers they think oh okay it's time to play a ballad i can i can rest i can yeah. like, oh, i can play brushes i like, can slack off i can like it's just this no no he wants to feel that intensity just as if we're playing you know giant steps it has to be that way you know yeah. and and i learned that i learned that from him and i'm really thankful and i use it in in most situations that i that i that i play in um i want to give the illusion that okay i'm in fifth gear when I'm really only in two and a half or three, you know, yeah. so that stuff, that pacing, that, that pacing thing is something that I, that I learned from him. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, man, he loved to play drums. So every time he would sit down and play drums, everyone sits, especially when they're not a drummer, they have a, they have certain, there's a certain beauty, a certain innocence about what they do on the drum set because they're not, that's not their main instrument. Yeah. So for a drummer, it's interesting because that approach is so different. They don't they don't care about the rules or they care about the history that has happened. They're just trying to play. You know, um, case in point, you know, Steve. I was watching Steve get uh, a few months ago or something like that, and he told me, or he said, actually, I did meet Steve a few times, but he said in the interview that the way he got to understand what Tony Williams was doing was through Chick Corea playing drums. <laughs> he watched wow. Chick Corea playing drums. Chick sat down and played, and and Steve was like, oh, "That's what it is," because he could not figure out what it was up until that point. Because so at that point, you know, we weren't in the YouTube area uh, era, sure. so you know, it wasn't like like today. Yeah, now can it's easy, YouTube and, and it's like, yeah. you know, so and, you know, so back then we had to really use our ears. We really had to like, 
you know, chime in and try to figure out what it is, what it was that that person was doing. I exactly. think I, I think it trained us better because I think now it's it's amazing to have YouTube, but it makes us lazy because we don't want to do the hard work of like yeah. being frustrated and going back and going back and like what exactly. is that and, and not figuring it out and may, maybe even come back the next day right trying to say okay oh shit that's what it is as opposed it's so yeah. like youtube slow it down okay that's what it is and so there's a true there's a right there's something that gets lost in that translation when you do it that way right yeah it, there's something like you don't really you know, it's I don't know. I don't want to say respect it. Right. It's too easy. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, in a way, I mean, you put up, you put the hard work in, you're going to get it. So, um, you know, Brecker loved Elvin. He loved train. So he would sit down and play these things. And I'd be like, what is that, man? Show me, you know, it was that. So those are fun days, you know, for me, just to That's sit so down and he, man, him and Adam, if my drumsticks are sitting idle, one of them have, will have my sticks in their hand. Uh, Adam also. <laughs> always, oh, okay. It was always that way. Oh yeah, Adam is a pretty good drummer, man. He's he's got some stuff. He, don't <laughs> don't let him fool you. Yeah, he, okay. he plays a lot of stuff. Uh, probably a lot a lot of stuff you hear. Um, I'm not like a big so, uh, social media cat, but you know, um, if you hear something on Instagram, some funky stuff, it's usually Adam messing around on the drums. You know. <laughs> Especially oh. during COVID, yeah. So they yeah. can't, yeah, we, yeah. That, he's a he's a he's a good drummer too. I mean, man, I man. think, man, I think it's it's super important for many instrumentalists to, to know what it feels like to sit behind the drums because, yeah. right, the drums are a super important part of any band, right? Some people say it's the most important part of the band, but uh, I won't go that far. I'll just say it's a super important part of of the band, and it's not until you can sit behind that the kit and almost kind of try to figure out what you're hearing so you yeah. can show that to a drummer and it gives you a different respect because a lot of people just write these things and it's like these tunes are so weird and whatever and they give it to the drummer and say man make it sound good yeah exactly you make it sound good like you know yeah. and then if you don't do if you can't do what they're hearing and they can't explain it then it's still your fault oh man you, man he's sad he can't play what I, you know he couldn't play my music <laughs> I can't exactly. play your music. You didn't. You didn't sit down and show me how to play your music. You can't. You know, and you know people don't know how to write drum charts, and you know it's it's a it's a whole whole bag of yeah. Worms. I, I would <laughs> never, uh, man. man I, you know, I, I would never write if I have a good drummer. I would never write a drum chart. Like you know, I played with <laughs> Tom Rainey or Tyshawn or all these guys. Right, you, right. You know, you, you guys know about everything about rhythm. Who am I? You know. I, I'm just like humbled that you put your your you know creativity yeah, in our spirit makes, in it exactly. exactly it's just no no it's you know it's like what so you're gonna go to the hospital <laughs> you need a you need a surgery and you're gonna wait 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 yeah i think you need to use the number four scalpel exactly. no not that one okay no no okay try number two <laughs> you know what exactly how is yeah. it how does that work you know and i've always been one to me and Greg, who's my, you know, he's like Greg Hutchins is my like little yeah. brother. Like we get into it in that because Greg is like, don't tell me what to play on the drums. I play the drums, you play the horn. That's how it goes. And Bill Stewart's that way. And I've been like, no, you can tell me what to play. And I've opened that door regretfully, you know, too often because when I've done that, then it invited that person to come in and be like, oh yeah, do this. Oh, don't do that. Try that. Yeah, and, their... and then at the end of the, the gig or end of the record date, it doesn't feel good because I'm already out of my head creatively because you don't want me to be creative, right? If you're yeah. telling me everything to play, then I'm going to stop thinking. Well, I'm just going to be a robot and you tell me what to play and, and it's going to be exactly. that way. Yeah. And then you're not going to get, as you know, that creative thing that you weren't even thinking about on on exactly. the drummer doing you know what i'm saying like exactly. so you know you need to be you know people band leaders or people that write for drummers need to understand when to get out of the way and let the magic happen you know this yeah. is what we do we don't tell you how to play over some changes exactly. <laughs> right yeah, yeah sir you know, it's just a respect it's a respect thing you know <laughs> yeah. how are you if, if i turn it around now we're you know how are you as a band leader like, how did you, I, I, I know you did like, you know, Pence Landing, that's 1977. And, but how mm -hmm. did you, 
how did you become a band leader and how did you evolve as a band leader in your how, how do you see that you being a band leader opposite to being a side man or a side person or... side man well um first of all so i became i was thrown into being a band leader by jerry teekins when jerry called me and said hey man i dig what you you know you're playing i want you to do a record i hadn't mm -hmm. really thought about putting a band together i you know when i was in college so this is early 90s when i did pins yeah. landing um so i was in college a few years right be before that so you know in, in college of course you have a quartet or you have you know i was doing gigs around richmond virginia and writing tunes and you know being mentored by Wynton marcellus so i was trying to write songs like him and and you know getting guys together yeah. and, and practicing so but um going back to that the, the first crisscross record when jerry put me in that position i felt like you know i was that was my first foray into being a real kind of uh, a band leader but how i evolved being i think a successful band leader is being a, a successful sideman me oh, yeah. the way that i approach it is that I'm super sensitive to how guys feel around on the road, in the session, in the session, just just period. I check in with them. We talk about music, and and you know I think it's super important that you communicate. I think a lot of people are afraid to communicate. Communicate. So I, I learned that through my years of being in really famous bands where the band leader didn't communicate to the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. what he or she liked you know and I know what that feeling was like me being in the rhythm section and 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 us building even a bit of resentment toward that leader yeah. because they can't or won't explain what they want or won't talk about the music or won't you know so um me when I approach being a, a band leader it's like I I, I want to check in I want it to be a fun spiritual open experience um and i want the by the people in my band to 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 be able to come to me and and, and or come to us and talk about the music a lot yeah. of times people they get in bands and they feel like they got to be quiet oh it's not my band you know what i'm saying um I think the magic happens when there is a conversation. Yeah, I like that too. Discussion, yeah, I like that. When there can be, yeah, when there can be that that aspect, you know. Um, I you know, as a band leader, I can't I can't think of everything. And, you know, I may do something that offends you. Please come to me and let's talk about it because that's gonna make me a better band leader. It's gonna make me a better person. Hopefully it's gonna do the same thing to you also. If I yeah. come to you, you're in my band. And I don't like your approach on a certain thing. I'm not going to say, man, that sucks or whatever. I'm like, hey, this is kind of what I was hearing, at least for this song. Let's do yeah. that. And I, I always have, not that you need it as a band leader, you know, Betty Carter would say, it's my band. You do what I want or get out, you know. But for me, it's like I would always have, a, um, you know, I would have, I would be able to follow up with an explanation why I want you to play this way. Yeah. You know, yeah. because, you know, right. what's happening as a when you're a band leader and you're presenting music. It's just that it's not just you are just playing the songs that you wrote in front of people. You're trying to tell a story, in my opinion, you're presenting something and 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 you're trying to present it in a beautiful way. You're not just saying, ah, take it. You're like saying, try this. It's almost like eating, right? Yeah, when you go to a, a fine restaurant right. and you have a seven course meal, if they brought everything out at the same time, would that be successful? No, you don't know where to start. Or you'd be like mixing taste and like, you know, yeah. presenting a concert should be as if you're walking into a fine restaurant having, if you got 10 tunes, a 10 course meal. It's a that story. That pacing yeah. is super important, right? Yeah, yeah it's so, a story. Yeah, um, yeah that's how, that's how I, I really... Uh, approach you know being uh, a band leader I, I I've always been one to try to share experiences where there are the good or bad mistakes that I've made on the road especially if I had like 
Chad, Chad Lefkowitz is mm -hmm. much, he was the youngest person in the band. And I remember, you know, this is superficial, but like, I remember we were in Mexico touring and, and we were in this town. I was like, Chad, probably want to be careful about, you know, drinking water from the, you know, yeah, yeah. this place in there. And, and Chad was like, yeah, yeah, I, I got it. I got it, you know. <laughs> and he didn't listen. And then a few days later, he's got the, the, the thing that everybody gets when they tour, you know, Mexico. And um, and I said, Chad, man, I, you know, I'm telling you this stuff because these are the mistakes that I've made. It's almost like, you know, I don't want to say they're my children in that way. But like, I, I wish when I was 22 that I had an adult, you know, somebody was telling me about the mistakes that they made pulling my coat so I wouldn't make that same mistake. You yeah. Know? I've so always, important. yeah, when, yeah, when you can learn, like Lewis Nash was super important um, in my development. And man, I would listen to everything he said. I would hang on every word. Oh, he did this on the road. Okay, I'm gonna, you know, like <laughs> I, I wanted to learn from, from those mistakes so I wouldn't do them, you know? Yeah. Like, you know, you, you hear about guys not being prepared for gigs. I don't want to do that. I want to be prepared for the gig. When I walk in, like I've heard, like some guy told me before, he's like, man, damn. Man, you know my music better than me, you know, like, and I, and, and I yeah. wasn't reading the music. I'm like, you know, I don't know how to take that, but like, I definitely checked your music out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it, you know, I, I remember, um, I was doing a rehearsal with Daryl Clayton, who's my favorite. Young yeah. Player. I love Daryl. Yeah. Uh, I was doing a tour with him and, and, um, um, bass player uh who lives in paris now his regular bass oh, player uh, joe joe, Sanders. joe, yeah, joe. Yeah, yeah. yeah so i was subbing so i'm super happy to, to be subbing because uh um it's a killing trio you know that the trio that they had with yeah um so and i remember i got the music i don't know if i got it super on time but i got the music and but i had you know did my homework so we get to rehearsal and Gerald count the tune off like we were on at a concert. Like it wasn't like, you know, like in my band, I will count things down slower. Yeah, yeah, like, sure. let's, let's, <laughs> let's really, you know, make sure that this is how it goes. And we'll do it a couple of times. And then I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna move the gear up, or we'll let's we'll skip two gears and then I'll really put it up. Those guys. It was like gear four already. It was just, I was like, whoa. Yeah. But luckily I knew the music yeah. because if I, at that point, I couldn't have been reading. It was like sure. happening too yeah, fast. Too yeah. And Joe is so organic and he's not playing what's on the page. Yeah. He's already like, you know, so luckily I had it internalized so I could, I could really deal with it. Gonzalo was the same way when I played with Ruba Kaba. Oh, um, yeah. You can see my first concert, first concert of playing with that band is in Spain. It's on, it's on YouTube. Oh, really? I really, that concert. Wow. Man, okay. And, and when you look at that concert, that concert was no rehearsal. Oh, wow, <laughs> that concert man. was like sound check. And you know, um, that record, uh, I think it was called This Is It or something like that. That's yeah. a record with, you know, Marcus Gilmore. I mean, man, those guys write hard music, Giuseppe yeah. and Gonzalo. But yeah, man, he called, we, we got to sound check and Gonzalo counted the tunes off as it, the same tempo oh, that we're going to do it. Like, or if not faster. Oh, yeah, and it was sir. just like, it was just like, I was like, man, it's like, I, how, how could you... <laughs> you know how can you not like you 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 would just sink if you're not prepared yeah. you have to know you have to so i mean i guess i have certain ways of me internalizing people's music but like yeah it's man i don't know it's it's super important that you 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 have to engage in in the music and you have to be able to approach that person's music I think you should have two or three ways that you can approach it because you never know. You know, you listen to a record, a record, Betty told me, a record is just a picture, a small picture mm. that some people want to keep captured in time. And it's that picture, but yeah. live, it's not that picture anymore. Because when I, um, when I was playing with Betty and I was listening to these records and she, she told me, she was just like, you know, you just listen to a picture, right? And I didn't understand what she meant. I was like, what? She's like, baby what you're listening to that was just one point one moment in time that's not the way it is or the way they're gonna play it when you see them again 
So yeah. don't get too wrapped up in in that 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 picture, you know. So Makes um, sense. Yeah. yeah. So man, when I when I learn somebody's music, I learn it fast. I learn it slower. I learn it fast. You know, I play it faster than them. I That's play it important. slower yeah. than them. I play it at the tempo that I hear that, and and I can do that because we have amazing slowdown and we have transcribe. Yeah, yeah, we have sure. these, these tools, sure. which I I I I you know I rely on heavily. I That's rely okay. on uh, Logic, all of those, all those things that can help me. I rely on. Yeah, yeah. 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 Claire, it's just not to take too much of your time so that you can enjoy the beautiful <laughs> co country there. I'm I, sorry, I, man. We, we're like low. I'm like <laughs> so. I'm yeah. like, Wow, no, Clarence, your answers. <laughs> no, I love it, man. I'm, I, you know, I, I'm always like a small kid, you know, you know, in a stand -bug, like, Oh, yeah, tell me all this stuff. Uh, but, but no, I, I'm envious. You're there because you know I love it there. So, but uh, just wanted to ask, since you mentioned Betty, like I know you were probably like 21 or 22 when you got the gig, right? Right. Yeah. How, how was 22? Those I think it was. Yeah. Experience like for you, like I, I think you played with her for three years, right, or something. Yeah. 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 Um, How did that happen? Actually, you know, it was the, uh, can, the experience for you. Well, the, the gay hack happened because of uh, Lewis Nash, who you know was. Um, I met Lewis Nash in eighty six, eighty seven. Oh, wow. Already, I was at I was at University of Miami, studying classical and drums, and Lewis came down with Branford Marcellus, they had him come down to play a concert. They had just did, uh, you know, that music, that uh, the record that, that Lewis is on, Lewis, Silbert, Felix, Branford. Are you yeah. aware of that record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Random, random ab abstract. Random, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, and I didn't know who Lewis was, you know, I, at that point I was all tamed out. So it was like, if you're not tamed, then, you know, I don't have time for you. It, it was like that kind of thing. And Lewis came down and I remember, on the side is being on the side of the stage just like this <laughs> like the clarity the swing like this guy I was like what the what the f this guy is yeah. like amazing who is this and I spoke to him after the concert and he was so gracious and and just a sweet person um we became you know friends after after that I stayed in touch with yeah, at this point so we didn't have email I would write letters I would send a postcard I oh, give a call beautiful. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I, I, I pursued that and, and when he, whenever he would come to town, he would call me, say, Hey man, I'm playing in DC. Just letting you know, I drive up to DC. I'm playing, oh, wow. you know, whatever. It was that kind of thing. And so when I graduated, I remember calling Lewis about a week later and say, Hey man, I'm out. I graduated school. And he says, Oh, really? Okay. I may have something for you. Oh wow! Yeah, I can't tell you what it is, but I may have something for you. And then he calls me a few days later, and he says, "Hey, Clarence, you know Lewis. I don't know if you've known Lewis. You should definitely have him on this thing." But oh um, yeah, he says, "He says, uh, hey, Clarence, um, Betty might be calling you." <laughs> and I was wow. just like, "Betty Carter?" He was just like, <laughs> "Yeah, yeah. She's you know she's been looking for for a drummer, and she hasn't been uh, necessarily happy with you know." the the prospects that she had so she may be calling you i'm not telling you she's gonna call you but she might be calling you you know and um you know so she called me about a week later you know and um actually i didn't believe it was her when she first called and you know i thought somebody was like joking around like hang and i hung up the phone and you know because i was running out to the gig and phone rings right again you know and i hang, and i pick it up she's like look if you want this gig you know you better hang up this phone or whatever i was like oh, God, i'm so sorry betty what you know and she was like you know so lewis tells me you can play i need you in new york tomorrow i was in west virginia at the time i was wow. like tomorrow i had a gig i had a five night a week gig in, in west virginia that i hated by the way but um and she was like, yeah, I need you. And so, man, I went, I went to work that night. I quit and packed up the truck and drove to New York. Oh, man. So that's how I, that's how I got the gig. Um, but Betty, you know, it was, uh, it was like going into the army, you know, oh, it wow. was, yeah, it was, um, yeah, you know, you know, you have basic training and then you have combat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that, that, that was a war know, zone. <laughs> that was it. And then a war zone. You know, I, I definitely, my basic training was great. <laughs> she loved everything that I did for my basic training, you know. And then about, um, so my first, to make this quick, I did three weeks of the West Coast. We were, I moved to, came to New York. We rehearsed for three days. Went on a three-week tour of the West Coast, right? All oh. of the West Coast. Came back for five days. Went to Europe for six weeks of one-nighters. We had like six three days weeks. off. Six weeks of one-nighters with three days off. We had a day off in Poland. We had a day off in Madrid and a day off in like uh, uh, Bulgaria. That yeah. was your first time in and, Europe uh, also? Then like That was touring, my first right? time in oh, Europe. Wow. Yes. Oh, man. I overpacked. I bought a big ass suitcase. Of course. <laughs> me and, you know, I remember me and, uh, me and Cyrus, we were in Poland, Warsaw. Our, we were just like, man, we're not going to be able to make this. This it's, it's too hard. Grabbing the big suitcase, I got my symbols. And so we go to the post office and we get a box and we take half of our clothes out of and send it back to the, and the guy in, in, in Warsaw was just like, you know, this is going to take like six weeks or seven weeks to get back. And me and Cyrus is like, yep, we're going to be out here six weeks. So no problem. <laughs> so we sent half of our, our stuff back, but, um, Man, Betty was lugging those suitcases, throwing them in, in, off, in and off the train, like with no problem. Like, you know, just she sleep, the train comes in, like she just had it down. Man, and I was just like so amazed cool. because I was like, man, I'd be afraid. Like I couldn't rest because I thought I was going to oversleep and miss the yeah. stop. And, you know, and then a lot of times we get off the train and we have a, like 10 minutes to make the next connection, but it's way down, you know, it was that kind of thing. So that was part of it. That was the part of the, the, starting the war and uh yeah when we got into full combat it was like you know nights i could be like the best drummer in the world and nights i could be the worst drummer in the world and it was like a constant roller coaster so it was it was quite an experience uh you know all the way around emotionally yeah. technically you know she hated she didn't hate philly Joe, but she hated if you did anything with the rim shot, like if ah, you played well, okay. that that two that thing yeah, that Philly Joe. Yeah, yeah. She would, she'd be in the concert and turn around and 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 stare you down and be just like no. She would either say don't do that or Ugh! she would make it known that she hated that. So and that was the first time because man, I was like twenty two. I grew yeah. up on Philly Joe. I'm like Philly Joe yeah. is my man, and like you know, I'm thinking like I'm making a swing and I'm like King Kakati. And she's like, nope. <laughs> so, um, so that was a that was a that was a that was a big thing uh, in in the war. Um, she, you know, being, I think that's the fastest that I've ever had to play, even to this day. And Lewis Nash told me that he said, once you play with Betty and you play those temples, you probably won't play those temples with anybody else. Mm. Well, and and I didn't really, I was just like, man, everybody plays fast, but people don't play fast. With Betty, you play it as fast as you could. <laughs> and then the next song would be as slow as you could play. That's yeah. why, that's kind of how I developed, you know, playing with my hands because we'd be playing in these venues and Betty was saying the brushes are too loud or you, it's too clinky or too, you yeah. know, I was at, tw I was 22. So I was in, I was into, or I was on auto drummer, young person's mode. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't necessarily trying to make music. I'm trying to make sure my sweep is correct and like yeah, yeah. and like Elvis, you know, I'm like, I'm just playing the drums. I'm not playing the music. I'm playing the drums. And she would turn around and be on me about that. So um, after a while we got it together and she did make a comment one time to, to this is when Chris Thomas was in the band mm -hmm. and she says, I, what I do love about this trio is that it allows me to, to I can sing as soft as I want to. Oh, yeah. And you guys are right there with it because she always had powerhouse bands. And that was, that was, that was, that was the vibe. But with, with the way that I played in the way Cyrus and Chris could, could adapt, we played super slow and super soft and, and Betty could like not push. And I yeah. think she, she enjoyed she enjoyed that that fact, you know, and and you know, in a way, you could kind of say that it was something. Um, it was a new kind of a new experience for her because you think about 
all of those bands she played in, right? The beep, yeah. beep up was beep up was hard yeah. hitting. If you play, you know, bird train. I mean, you're gonna play. You know, it's not about like trying to be all like foo foo and, and you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. So you know, all her bands were all her trios. Greg Hutchinson, man, that guy is like my favorite drummer. That guy hits. Yeah. He can play the drums. When our Harper plays the drums. Ralph Peterson, when he got when he came yeah, in yeah. after me, he plays the drums. You know, all of those guys. You know, and. Um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have that approach, but it gave Betty an opportunity to be able to to explore that. And she did, you know. Yeah, yeah I, I played a lot of mallets. I played a lot of colors. It helped me, you know, further my color palette, you know, because Betty would say, man, bring more colors, I more colors, more colors. And I was like, oh, great. You know, so I would bring all these things, you know, um, the splashes and all that kind of stuff. So, it, it, you know, I think we we approached her gig in a different way. You know, you, like yeah. out, of, out, of, out of all of the bands that she had, you can definitely say we were, you know, a different approach to, yeah. to a lot, a lot, a lot had been before us. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. She was, you know, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was incredible in, in every sense of the word. Like I say, emotionally, yeah, and yeah. when I say incredible, it's not always great, right? It's not people say incredible like thinking that you're happy. No, incredible means that the experience was so, so full of yeah. of, of everything, you know. Um, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot on that gig. Yeah, it's like food, you know. You 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 get exactly. something that you think was gonna be sweet, but then it's like bitter, and it's like, oh man, exactly. That's exactly cool, you know? something. There you like go, this. exactly. Yeah. I love that. There you actually. go, because hey, that that plays into um, that plays into like you know you you thinking that something is going to sound like something or it's going to yeah, feel like something, exactly. or taste like something, you know. And when yeah, you get Betty's gig, you think it's going to be this. Like okay, so case in point, quickly, when I got the gig with Steps Ahead, yeah, when Mike um, Maneri called me, that that uh, said, that's a total surprise for me. Like you know, in your discography. The, oh, it, really? It's like steps ahead, really? I, like, <laughs> really? But yeah, I mean, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Clarence. No, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I was well, Mike. I think he called me because I got to get you know. And when I left Betty, I I went with Stanley Clark, and Mike saw me play with Stanley Clark. And when we played that trio, it was no jazz. Okay, it was jazz because it was Stanley Clark, but it was yeah. no, you know, no no tipping around on that. I had like double bass drums, and, really? and Stanley told oh, me wow. when I joined the band. Stanley told me, he says, yeah, man, I want you to have everything you can get on that stage. <laughs> it was like that kind of vibe. And Stanley took me in his, he had a Bentley. He took me in a Bentley. We went to Guitar Center. He's like, yeah, pick up whatever else you need. It was like that kind of vibe. It oh, was like man. my life, my life at that point, I, it was like, it was like a dream because check it out. Um, once I got the gig, once Stanley was in Japan when he, when he heard the tape that I had, FedEx his wife and his wife played the tape to Stanley over the phone my audition tape Stanley says yes she calls me she says Stanley says yes I go to Blue No. I quit Betty's gig that Sunday oh, man. Do it right. wow. you know it was like a whole whirlwind I quit Betty's gig she wasn't happy I saw her a few days she definitely wasn't happy I go to California Stanley says man welcome you need every drum you can get I call Dennis Chambers and Dennis oh, Chambers says, oh, man, you got the gig with Stanley? I'm going to call Pearl and tell them they should hook you up. I called Pearl. Pearl was like, what do you need? I was just like, I was like, all right, um, I'm going to be in California. And I hadn't been, you know, I was just like, I'm going to be in L.A. And I'd like to have this, this. I like the list. And it was just like, okay, cool. Oh, man. Just like that. I called Zildjian. Zildjian was just like, what do you need? Okay, well, we have an office in uh los angeles you just go over there and you see this person they'll take care of you it was just like that and then i get to rehearsal and stanley's like you know i had all these pearl drums brand new boxes and all that stuff it was normal for uh, the la cats to see this yeah. so i get there i'm open i'm, I'm just like fucking christmas and i and i'm you know <laughs> opening everything and then stanley's like yeah i'm gonna take you to guitar center because you ever play you know like electric drums like you know let's look around we'll get some stuff you know, I go out and he's got this black Bentley. We get this fucking the sunroof oh, is man. off and, you know, we're driving. He takes me, he's just like, get it. He's like, but whatever you want. That's and amazing, I'm just man. like, 
wow okay so i, I get all that so but coming back to the story so mike i think seen me play so he knew that i could do he knew i played with betty and he knew that i, I was into playing louder music also um so when i got the when i got the call from mike you know he's like yeah i'm putting another iteration of, of steps and hits together and i like you and donnie mccaslin to be in it mm, and i was oh, like yeah. oh man cool so you know but getting back to that taste thing that you said, like, right, you think it's going to be this way and it actually yeah. turns out to be another way. I get to rehearsal, me and Donnie, you know, before that, I'm checking out oops, I'm checking out pools, I'm checking out all of this, all my favorite Steps Ahead recording, so I'm ready. I'm like, Peter Erskine, I've been, you know, yeah. my rims, my, clicking on my rims, all that stuff. I get there, and Mike's like, yeah, yeah, no, we're not going to do any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah. It's all new stuff. And I'm like, me and Donnie looked at each other, I was like, what? You know, this I want to do that stuff. I want to play pools. Yeah. I want to, you know. And Mike was like, you know, Mike was beyond. He was he was past that. That was a you know another uh, point in his life, another time in his life. He was on to the next thing. So you know, I had to you know just to to be able to shape into whatever he needed us to be going forward. And yeah. and it worked out. It was nice. And as yeah, time yeah. you know went on, we did revisit those two he would pull out those tunes rachel z was in the thing um he would pull out those those tunes i, I mean like especially victor bailey played you know he did one tour oh and, man wow. and for me to play with victor bailey was oh. just like you know i mean i remember man i was in my 20s i mean i just remember me and victor and rachel they i remember i was on the road with them on my birthday march 2nd and they took me out to some fish and chips place in in, in England because we were at Ronnie Scott's for like a week, you know, I think a oh, week wow. or two at the time. But um, yeah, Mike, we didn't Mike was like, you know, he come to rehearsal. He was like, yeah, he wouldn't say anything. He just put the music in front of, you know, and you see like it's oops. And you're like, you know, it was just that that kind of thing. So, yeah, it was. And so he started pulling out those those tunes every now and again and and you know we play it and he he knew we were like, super excited because we like overplay you know yeah, yeah. everything you know just, you know we just just you know those are hit songs for, sure. for me growing up definitely you know? yeah like definitely. you know it's like my parents growing up with james brown and playing in his band or something you know yeah, yeah. definitely that was yeah. <laughs> it was quite an experience yeah but wow. yeah man i mean I, i've been i've been fortunate i've always just wanted to you know play music you know, um, not necessarily fit into a category. Maybe that's bad. Maybe I don't I don't know, because some people, when they fit into a category, they do that very well. And then people know them for that. And then that's it. For me, that's a, a bit limiting. I, I, I want to be boring to maybe. I, for me, it would get boring. It would be, yeah, it would be boring, also. you know, coming back to food, right? We couldn't eat the same thing. My kids are spoiled because I cook them almost, it's almost, like when I'm in New York, it's almost like a restaurant every night. Like, you know, it's not like we're having leftovers. And I, and I feel I'm bad. The same, like, man. Sometimes I'm the you same, guys man. can eat, you can, yeah. you know, I'm like, my wife laughs at me because I wake up in the morning and I'm already thinking about what's on the menu. Man, I'm day, the same. You know? <laughs> Yeah. It's it's important. You can't leave it out to the last second. Yeah. And they may complain, but they love to eat it, you know. Yeah. And, and you know, there's no there's there's such a, an amazing feeling when you can play a concert, when I can play the drums and have somebody come to me and say, Man, I never heard the drums like that, or I didn't know the drums could be that soft, or I didn't know the cymbal yeah. could sound this way, or I, and same thing when I cook up cook something or make something and somebody says, I didn't know rhubarb could taste like that. I didn't know yeah. peas could taste like that i didn't know steak could be this way it's the same thing for me and for yeah, you too i, I know it's the same you know yeah. it's 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 i don't it's symbiotic it they have to be together you know i always connect <laughs> these food and music man like, right you know i'm gonna make now a we gotta we gotta line. do something yeah get out of here you need this you need to send me the recipe <laughs> yeah it's like a kale pie hey. with uh, ricotta and stuff it's man, I, I man we eat recipes. kale every week Oh, uh, you may please share the recipe. We yeah, kale every week. I use uh, cream scale, uh, cream kale. Uh, I sauteed. I mean, like, yeah, it's, okay, it's you, such you, a you, super. You, sorry, you you ever had a kale salad, like like raw kale with Parmigiano yeah. cheese, it, olive oil? Yeah, and, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Come on, man. Of course, you you um you, you know you have to do a chiffon uh, the way I do it, I, really thin. Right, yeah, because yeah, sure, kale, sure. a lot of times the people say that leaves are, are, are rough, but if you keep it, if you do a chiffonade very thin, 
Forget about it. And it's all fluffy with the Parmesan. Oh, oh man. About, man, you're making me hungry now. Come on now. I'm, I'm, I mean, <laughs> at the end of um, <laughs> at the end of this, so I'm going on tour with Christian Sands uh, in two days. And our last gig is in Bologna. And you know, Bologna is one of the, uh, an important city for food for in Italy. So, and that's hands down, Italy and Japan is probably my two favorite countries. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to say hands down because I, I was in Argentina a couple of years ago. That was amazing. Oh too. man, I believe I don't you. know. Denmark has some great food too. But um, yeah, so we're going to end there and I'm, I'm already looking forward to the wine and, and the food that we're going to have, you know. Man. Don't forget the oysters. Hey, hey, people, Don't forget the oysters. Uh, I, I... Talker Jazz.